Hello everybody and welcome to Alan History Nerd. In this video I am going to look at probably one of, if not the most scandalous character from the period of Tsarist Russia, Grigory Rasputin. And we're going to look at a bit about his life and his exploits uh, and the, probably the most famous thing about him, his death. So, Rasputin, really, really important in the story of the Fort of the Tsar and just a wonderfully scandalous and interesting character. So Rasputin, <clears throat> the, the man and the myth, well, he was said to have these hypnotically um, piercing eyes and, and, and just kind of could get people to do what he wanted them to do. And, and the, everyone was really struck by this. They were also quite struck by the odour that came from him. And according to some sources, he smelled like a goat. Um, he was believed to have healing powers. Uh, there are... <clears throat> rumours that he had a kind of uh, an endless sexual appetite, but there's uh, other rumours that he was completely impotent. Um, so they, they vary quite dramatically. The, the rumours that are slightly more flattering uh, suggest that he had a, uh, a very large um, mole or wart in a particular place that meant that people particularly uh, enjoyed their time with him. Again, how much truth there is in that, I have no idea. He is, of course, rumoured to be uh, the, the lover of the Russian queen. I mean, there's a whole song about it and everything. Um, it does seem that that was mainly rumours. There, there is a, a, I'll talk about it later, there's a, a letter that seems to suggest a, a great closeness between them, but it's doubted they were actually um, lovers. And again, he's very famous at the end for being the, the monk that wouldn't quite die. I mean, he does die, but it takes quite an enormous amount of effort. So Grigory Rasputin. So what do we know of his childhood? Well, he he was born um, in, in about 1869 in um, in a in a province of Western Siberia, uh, and we know Rasputin wasn't actually his real name. It it actually means debauched one, uh, and this seems to have been a, a nickname he picked up at school. Um, so we can get a bit of an idea about his uh, behaviour there. Um, he went to school, but didn't, seem to be, didn't become literate at school, and but he did pick up that nickname. Uh, he got married in, in 1887, um, and he remained in his, his, his childhood home, uh, and, and um, he had a wife and a couple of kids, and he was from peasant stock, and, and mainly fairly unremarkable until he got into his uh, later 20s. It's believed that in about 1897, he went, went, underwent some kind of religious conversion when visiting a monastery. I mean, he spent three years training to be a, become a monk, um, but um, left complaining about the behaviour of the monks, um, particularly allegations of homosexuality that he made. Um, so he returned to his childhood home. He came back a, um, a, a, a changed man. He became what is known as a, a stranic, a, a holy wanderer, walking around, visiting holy sites and preaching. And, and in doing this, he kind of um, gathered a small group of followers. Uh, he was rumoured um, <coughs> to be part of a cult, uh, the uh, Callisti cult. Uh, Callisti mean, literally means whip. Uh, and they, they were a religious sect that had very strange practices, including uh, late night meetings in which the members danced around naked and whipped each other. It's all a bit strange. Um, and they argued that, that um, religious redemption uh, was reached through sexual sin. Um, it seems to be something that, that Rasputin embraced, though, again, historians disagree about whether those rumours about him being in that particular group are true or whether this was just um, local priests who were jealous of, uh, of the hold he had over uh, members of the local congregations and wanted to get rid of him. So anyway, there, there, there are stories from early on in terms of his religious life that, that are quite scandalous. Now, his reputation spread through Siberia, uh, and in 1904 he travelled to Kazan, uh, and it was, he was seen as a holy man, and he could cure people's kind of religious anxieties and, and, and other ailments, uh, and he, he impressed the local church leaders, uh, and they gave him um, a less recommendation and, and helped him with passage, and he travelled to the capital, St. Petersburg. Uh, and there he met uh, a man called Theophan, who, who was well-connected. He was the, the confessor to... Um, the the Tsar and the Tsarina and could introduce um, Rasputin to people at court and there he um, 
he met and talked to members of, of the aristocracy. He met in these salons and discussed uh, religion and, and mysticism and all kinds of exciting things and looking for kind of escapism in, in, in from their, 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 their lives, although they were hugely opulent. I, I think the idea was a lot of them were rather kind of bored. Um, and so people like Rasputin kind of brought this kind of mystery and, and, and intrigue. Uh, several of these very close friendships he, he bonded with, with were a, a pair known as the Black Princesses. Um, uh, Meltisa and Anastasia of Montenegro, um, and they were they were married to the Tsar's cousin. So these ladies were <clears throat> had a bit of a reputation, hence the hence the the nickname. But they they had a bit of a reputation for being a bit wild. But they they were very very well connected. So he starts building a relationship with, with the Romanovs. So he, he's said to have first met the, the Tsar on the 1st of November in 1905. In, in fact, the, the Tsar records this in his um, diary. Uh, and then sometime between then and the end of 1906, he started to act as a healer for Alexei, uh, the Tsar's only son, who had haemophilia, which is a hereditary uh, blood disease where the blood doesn't clot properly and it, it means any cut is potentially life-threatening and any any slight knocks can lead to internal um, bleeding that lead to really potentially painful swelling and uh, <clears throat> and so Rasputin gains seemingly has this power to reduce Alexei's suffering and ease his pain uh, and to, to, to help to remove some of these painful swellings and the most remarkable story of this is comes from 1912 uh, Alexei develops a particularly worrying tumour as it was in his groin the do doctors couldn't do anything but uh, Rasputin apparently having heard the news it sent a telegram uh, talking of his prayers and, and to tell the Tsarina um, that that it was all going to be okay and that the tumour was going to go away uh, and it did. So Tsarina Alexandra was convinced that Rasputin had saved her son's life through a magical telegram and it, she talked of this as being a miracle and that from that point onwards Rasputin's kind of hold over the Tsarina was, was pretty uh, much established. Being so close to the Tsar and the Tsarina brought Rasputin great power at court, um, something he openly bragged about, that he essentially he could get people in whatever jobs they wanted, that he could make the Tsar and Tsarina do whatever he wanted them to do. And he used this influence to get to gain supporters. He then put those supporters into jobs in the civil service, in the church and even in government. Uh, he would accept bribes. Those people would come and, and seemingly take bribes and gifts. And according to uh, many rumours, he, he sexual favours from those who wanted his influence. Um, but he only really seemed interested in money. Uh, it only seemed interested in power, not money. Um, most of the, the money he received and, and, and gifts, he gave, gave them away. So he didn't seem bothered by that. It was the power that he was interested in. It was the power he bragged about. And he seems to really enjoy humiliating aristocratic ladies in particular, making them feel ashamed of their luxurious lifestyles. There's all kinds of really odd stories about him sticking his dirty fingers into um, pots of jam and making them lick the jam off. There's, uh, there's also um, stories that he slept with loads of them. I mean, one is said to have, have confessed that she had such a strong orgasm when she lay with um, Rasputin that she fainted. Um, so there was lots of stories going around. Again, we, how much of this is true, we don't know. Now, the rumours of the debauched behaviour about Rasputin and where he was behaving in both public and in private kind of started to spread. There was one particularly wild night, night out when he was said to have exposed himself to an entire restaurant, um, talked, talked about how he could get the Tsarina to do whatever he wanted. Uh, he was arrested, but on the orders of the Tsar, was, arrest, was, was released the very next day. Not long after this, there was a letter from the Tsar, uh, from the Tsarina to Rasputin that, that seemed to suggest to some people there might have been lovers. It definitely uh, <clears throat> it kind of showed an intimate a connection, this idea that she, she would want to, to sleep with her head on his shoulder. Now, it, we think that, that, that he was there as a, a kind of religious figure, as a healer, and, and th th there wasn't much more to it than that. But it was easy to make something out of it. And, and often in this, it's not the truth that really mattered, but the, the perception. And so the... the um, the court become incredibly unhappy, or many people at court become very unhappy about this influence of uh, of Rasputin. And it really damages, obviously, the opinion that lots of people have of the Tsar as well, because it appears that there's this um, this peasant that his wife might potentially be having an affair with. 
But the Tsar dismissed all complaints from leading members of the church and the government, including from Stolypin, about Rasputin and his behaviour because he didn't want to upset his wife and his wife believed that Rasputin could heal their son. So Rasputin was building some very powerful friends in the Tsar and Tsarina but also some, and, and others that he put in post, but also some very powerful enemies. During the, uh, the, the war, the, the Tsar went away to the front, leaving her, his wife, who happened to be German, in charge of running the government at home. And Rasputin's influence over the Tsarina became even bigger, and he seemed to be the key advisor. And this really worried people, and they wanted to do something about it. There were several attempts to remove him, including offering him 200,000 rubles to return to Siberia and leave the Tsarina alone. As I said earlier, he didn't seem to be motivated by money, so he turns that uh, that money down and stays in place. Now, there then is this plot to kill him, and it, it focuses around uh, Prince Felix Yusupov, who was, uh, according to um, to some uh, some sources, was a, a, a gay lover of Rasputin. Uh, he also happens to be married to a, a very the very glamorous um, uh, niece of the Tsar. Um, and the, the, so part of this seems to have been, I don't know whether it was a couple of motivated by uh, a kind of um, a gay group at court, and because there's a couple of other uh, supposed homosexuals who were involved in the murder of Rasputin. Another person involved um, was uh, Perishkovich, who was uh, the uh, rightist leader in the Duma, so a very, very significant um, political figure. Uh, now, Yusupov invited Rasputin uh, to his house on the pretext he would, was going to introduce him to his very glamorous wife uh, and then proceeded to poison Rasputin. So they poisoned uh, some Madeira wine, which is a sweet wine, which is a particular favourite of Rasputin's, and also um, some cakes. Uh, and they, they poisoned them with cyanide. Now, there was he, he ate the cakes, he drank the wine. It, it, this should have been enough cyanide to kill, well, not just one man, but many. Um, People talked about it saying it was enough, uh, enough to kill several horses, let alone several men. Whether the cyanide was out of date or something, but for whatever reason, it didn't seem to go particularly to plan. So Rasputin ate and drank the poison, seemingly having no effect, getting a bit drunk because he was drinking wine, but other than that, no real effect. So Yusupov decides that he has to, to um, take this further, and whilst Rasputin was, was inspecting a particularly uh, precious and fine crucifix that, that Felix had, it, Felix shot him. They then, he and the other conspirators then left Rasputin dead, they thought, on the floor uh, and went about to have a drink and celebrate. The unattended Rasputin gained consciousness and decides to kind of make his escape. Now he's not very really quiet about it, he's yelling that he's going to tell the Tsarina everything. Uh, and as he um, made his way across the courtyard, uh, Perishkovich um, shot him twice. He then kicked him in the temple. They then bound him in chains and dumped him in a river. This did eventually kill him. There are some accounts that actually he died of either drowning or hypothermia. When his, his body, he was murdered on the, the 16th, his body washed up on, on the 18th. And there are, there is stories that there was uh, water in his lungs suggesting that he'd um, actually drowned. Which is quite remarkable since he's been shot now three times, kicks in the head, poisoned. So, the monk that wouldn't die. A hugely controversial figure. How much of what I've said in here is uh, the absolute truth and how much of it is gossip that was made to try and destroy him, we're not quite sure. But there's lots of historians who spend lots of time uh, looking into this and it's a really, really interesting story. Um, it, it, Rasputin, whatever the truth is in terms of what he was and wasn't doing, definitively damage the reputation of the Tsar and Tsarina, and therefore plays an important role in their fall. Thank you very much uh, for watching. I hope you found that uh, informative. If you've enjoyed it, then please hit like. Uh, if you uh, haven't done also done already and you're enjoying the videos on Tsarist and Communist Russia or other parts of, of the history and politics content on here, then please subscribe. You'll get notifications as I add more material. If you have any comments or um, any questions, then please uh, leave those in the comment section and I'll try and get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you very much for watching.